Joe, welcome to the Progress Pure podcast. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's been fun following you. And uh, it's just cool uh, to be on here and, and have a conversation with you. Yes. <laughs> excited to have you. You're moving to New York soon. Yeah. Right. Can't wait. This is what I'm doing. My tactic is to just do as many episodes with people from New York as possible and make friends this way. <laughs> glean as many secrets to the city as you can right so you're fully prepared this is a nice strategy you're working with thank you thank you I, I it's tried and tested so far but yeah so this is probably the most anticipated conversation episode on progress pure that i've done and you know what i'm excited for it i well i'm excited too it's really flattering that you're saying that and uh i hope it's not an underwhelming experience for you <laughs> No pressure. So before we kind of dive into it, I the reason why this episode has kind of come about is because I ha am an avid watcher of 73 Questions by Vogue, which is obviously what you are the creator of, um, and was watching those videos and was really thinking, who is this guy? Like asking the questions, like, does, it, does this guy exist? Is it like, who is it? Like, who is this person? And so then came across your Instagram, shot you a message, and yeah, I'm super happy to say that that's why we're here today. Before we kind of delve into it, if you want to like introduce yourself or just say who you are a little bit, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so my name is Joe, and um, I guess the reason I'm in the mix with that type of stuff uh, that you've you know seen on my site or my Instagram is uh, a reflection of me being an internet creator. I guess I would define myself as that. You know, there's a lot of other adjectives I guess I can use, but I guess the one that's most relevant for the purposes of this conversation is um, I, you know, I, I'm an internet uh, creator artist who just makes a bunch of uh, different things that are interesting to me. Um, I've been doing that for a long, long time, right since college. I have this really unusual story that kind of stems from there. Um, but I've also had, you know, corporate experience. I'm just coming out of six years working at Condé Nast Entertainment, leading creative uh, for the video formats that come out of there for all the brands. So that's kind of who I am and, and 73 questions. Yeah, I'm the creator interviewer of 73 questions. We've been doing that for, uh, I think seven years at this point. Wow. So there's many different hats that I'm wearing. Um, and hopefully, uh, hopefully some of that will be interesting for your audience to hear. And so obviously my next question is gonna be, tell me about the unusual story that you briefly just mentioned there when you spoke about college to where you're at now. Oh, yeah. we're, going right, we're going right into it. We're jumping in. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I mean, I think I think the the story that I have, I think for anyone who's listening who can identify with this, is a story about thinking that your path is going to be one thing, and then it blindsides you that it becomes something else literally overnight. And um, in college, I went to this you know uh, Catholic Jesuit school named Boston College, mm -hmm. and Boston College is, you know, um, a really amazing place for community and for people who care about service and um, at the same time have uh, you know tremendous professional aspirations so professionally because a lot of people are you know in my upbringing it was like okay so what do you want to be when you grow up I, I really thought in my inchoate you know suburban upbringing that being a lawyer or being a politician was really the only thing <laughs> on my table I had a big personality I was class president for three years uh, I guess I'm going to be a politician and I guess I'm going to be a lawyer uh, before I become a politician. So I really had this like baked idea and it's so messed up in, in colleges, especially in America, maybe it's unique to America where freshman year, like you kind of come in having to really feel like you need to know, like you need to do for the rest of your life. Like the major that you choose is going to be the thing that you're, you know, uh, assigned mm -hmm. uh, as, as a career choice forever. So I really went in thinking that, okay, like I need to do whatever it takes to go down that path. And then you realize that halfway through, you entered this comedy group, you take your dad's camera that's been in this closet collecting dust for 10 years, and you start messing around with it. You start like teaching yourself how to edit. You start teaching yourself how to shoot. You start asking your friends to be in, you know, some ideas that you have. And then when you publish those things on the internet and it gets traction and it makes an impact, you then realize, wow, you can do this for the rest of your life. And that's the story for me is that, you know, picking up a camera and then tinkering and experimenting and creating ideas and expressing ideas through the seamlessness of just putting it online is life-changing yeah. it's empowering it's validating it, it, you know and i think from there from this web show that i created in college has just turned into this thing where you know being in media and entertainment and having control over my own ideas 
was the only option. Right. I pinpointed it like, ten, like October 10th, 2005. I'm sorry, October 13th, 2005 was the day I realized what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Whoa, that's awesome. Reading, reading in college, people are there watching, watching something that uh, we created and it's like it clicked. That's, wow. that's for me. Now, I was lucky to have that happen for me. That people, people are not that lucky to have it fall in your lap like that. But for me, that, that, was, the, that was the wake up call. So when you picked up your dad's camera, was it like a, an automatic, um, just kind of like draw to it? Because if you had the motivation to want to edit and film, it must have been something that um, it, like immediately sparked your interest. Yeah, it's a great question because I think, I think that a lot, especially in the creative world, creative arts, a lot of it's connected from an earlier age. And when I, when I really connect dots now to try to figure out how I got to where I got right now, there's another story inside that story of me as a 13 year old with my best friends, you know, uh, Paul Golias, shout out to Paul. <laughs> he had a VHS camera that he used with his parents, uh, that he, from his parents that allowed us to, you know, take tapes of GoldenEye and uh, James Bond GoldenEye and be able to kind of like edit it by, by dubbing our voice over the clips or by taking that camera and doing skits and sketches with other friends by having a web show, I'm sorry, uh, a public access television show that we made that probably three people were watching uh, accidentally, you know, that, that we were able to kind of create with, with a group of 17 best friends. So that literacy, that curiosity that magic of being able to have fun with the process of filming something and editing something mm -hmm. started as early as that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I haven't really thought about that in a while. So this is great how we're getting deep like this. Yeah, and how was it if you, firstly, I wanna know what happened on October 13th? Was that the day that you released your like web, um, was it a web series? Uh, yeah, so it was basically, it's so funny, I have my, <laughs> My parents gave me newspaper clippings of a uh, kind of, can you see this? Like, Let me see. This is a cast photo. Oh my God, no way. The, the, the local newspaper wrote a feature, a huge, huge press. Yeah. Uh, and um, it was basically this web show that, uh, I don't know, was the OC, is the OC popular in the UK? Yes, people watch it. Okay, so you know the premise about this like rough kid who gets picked up by this, you know, um, surfer, in a rich community of the OC. Yeah. So Boston College is BC, you know, like it, it sounds like the OC. What right. would BC be if it were a parody? Well, instead of a surfer lawyer taking in a rough kid from Chino, California, what if it's a, je a real Jesuit priest taking in a rough kid from rival school, Boston University? So that was the premise. Um, Father Don McMillan was there. Woody Tondorf was a rough kid from Boston University. And we did it as a joke total joke mm -hmm. and then there was enough demand where the community was like we want to see more of that so we turned it into a full web show we brought in famous alums 100 faculty members hundreds of students were involved massive community experience Whoa. and uh and it was it was life-changing and this was like right before youtube right before Whoa. youtube so timing was really interesting when it came to trajectories for sure and so when if you then um you know you're getting to grips with film you're starting to enjoy creating projects or if it's that's kind of like your first like big kind of project when youtube then comes about did you take advantage of it straight away did you see like oh i should start uploading my stuff onto here or anything like that or how did you carry on putting your stuff out there and like sharing it oh, wow i mean that that's such a crazy time because back then right before youtube you had to take your own files and pray to god that websites wouldn't crash because yeah. it would be big heavy quick time files and when the school had that on its servers, we were relieved because we didn't have to worry about websites crashing for people watching our videos. Yeah. But then when I graduated, I went out to uh, HBO. I got a job at HBO. Uh, Woody and I went there to co-found this lab under this uh, amazing woman named Franche, who's my mentor still today. And at that time though, this thing, YouTube is skyrocketing. Right. YouTube was so amazing, not just because you get to watch you know, hilarious Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live parodies or the funniest cat videos you've ever seen. But it allowed you to basically have that same effect of me publishing something seamlessly, but, but, but even more effortlessly. Yeah. It was this incredible way to express ideas and create kind of a, a library of your life. Like all of the videos that you would capture family for things your art projects can just be immediately available with the link to share. That was really insane. 
that was an insane breakthrough um, in, in media. And I think for, for me back then, knowing that that playground was available and knowing at that time that blogs were there posting the latest cool thing from the internet and curators on YouTube would say, this video of the day is really special stoked a curiosity to say, well, let's just keep going with ideas. Let's just keep trying things, experimenting, putting it out there and see if it gets picked up. So that was, that was, it was like the, it was like the wild west back then in the way that people were just kind of curious about creating things that stood out. And there's a lot of beautiful hobbyist culture back then. Mm -hmm. Now it's, you know, it's a little bit operationalized, it's commercialized, it's, there's a business strategy behind everything that's made, but yeah. back then it was, it was really, it was really beautiful time back then. It sounds, you know, hearing you describe it sounds so amazingly mystical and like exciting that did it feel that way at the time? Because now, like when I was growing up, it's just YouTube was kind of always a thing and it was always around. And so I never had that like, oh my God, this is so cool and kind of admiration for it. Did it really feel like um, exciting at the time when you were a kid? Oh, when, when I when I was um, leaving college around yeah, that age. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean it's funny in, in hindsight because for 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 me at that time, like that was really the only literacy I had in my in my adult life was like kind of like making things and putting it online. I remember clearly in college that those who were serious about doing media and entertainment would go to film school, they'd go out to Hollywood, they'd hope to get in a writer's room, and they go on the trajectory of you know, paying your dues for eight years and becoming a writer on a television show, crossing, like going to a talent agency, starting in the mailroom and maybe breaking into movies that way. Like there's, there's all these predestined paths to getting these traditional roles. And that was really seen as the only option. And for those, who, I have colleagues who did that very successfully, like they pay their dues, they're now doing television and film. But the most interesting thing was that I, I never was interested in that. And I think what's, mystical in, in, in your word, I, lo I love that word, is the, in, is the like not knowing what would happen if you chose this weird path of this thing called digital, this right. wild west of digital. There, there was no, there was no like goal attached other than to exist and have fun in it. Mm -hmm. Then as years went on, you realized that more and more people are paying attention to this. It's becoming like a robust <laughs> business opportunity to capture um, creators who are capturing attention by making things that stand out. Mm -hmm. Like virality mm -hmm. was a thing to be seized as a strategy. Mm -hmm. So I think in the early days, like there was really no strategy. I think that's what made it so special right. is that people were just doing it because there were strange honestly like okay go messing around with treadmills on a music video uh lego stop motion fan films being made this is dumb because people had an outlet and a curiosity to make something interesting and it's kind of beautiful when you think about it yeah it's beautiful it's also i have like a lot of admiration for you for thinking about it in this exciting way because obviously that's really exciting but it, wasn't it also like kind of scary as hell because if your friends who maybe are going into media and entertainment are taking like traditional roles and paths and you are like this is so cool I'm kind of gonna go with this like digital age and I guess as well like you said you got a job at HBO is that right so you're kind you're kind of with a company anyway um what was it not scary to be like I'm taking a, a path untrodden well, I mean, things got even even crazier when, um, you know, when I'm at this secure job, this like full time job for a couple of years, and I just decided to leave. I had this full time job at HBO, mm -hmm. and I decided to kind of leave halfway through. I created this I created this viral video secretly um, with Paul, who I mentioned, Paul from my childhood. The two of us put together this recap of The Sopranos, and I basically ripped all of these DVDs, took all of this footage, and just put my voice under every single clip, like 2,000 clips, just recapping everything that happened in the entire show, seven, seven minutes, 2,000 clips, watch this to get ready for the final season. Wow. And I remember I just put it together without HBO's permission. I'm working there. I'm like, this is going to be cool, right? And then, <laughs> and then 
I, I get like half of it done and it's like my voice going, so there's this guy, Tony, here's his wife, Camilla, <laughs> Anthony, Frank. you know, he gets, he sees some ducks, he shoots this guy, he goes, and it's basically like that fast. And I remember I showed it to the marketing people at HBO and they're like, they're like, this is cool, but too bad we can't do anything with it. No. And I'm like, oh no. And my boss, I'll never forget my boss, Fran, the mentor. She goes, I'm not going to tell you not to upload it, but if you do, don't put your name on it. <laughs> So I put together this recap. I put Paul's name on it. It says created by Paul, Paul. And we put it up and it gets like a million views in a day. No way. And it was a huge wake up call for me. A, the power of the internet. Like, oh my God. B, having a unique idea that you've never seen before means that people will pay attention. Mm -hmm. People will find it. Mm -hmm. It will go viral if mm -hmm. it's like that unique. And then C, you know, the, 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 the third thing I've learned is that in a corporate environment, corporations may be a little bit not on the same page of, about finding cool what you find is cool. Mm -hmm. it, it has a threat that you're, you know, leaking a bunch of footage and spoiling all the plot points in a mm -hmm. TV show. So, you know, there was a huge scandal that happened where lawyers tried to track down, you know, me and fire me for my job. And then the New York Times comes out saying this is one of the best ways to promote the series. And they got a lot wow. of free press for it. So I left my job knowing that I had the ability to create something that had unusual impact that a lot of people enjoy. Mm. That affirmation was enough to power me for the rest of my career, including to today. Mm -hmm. that I'm going to be fine. So as long as I just keep making things that I'm interested in, that's it. Wow. Wow. What an awesome it sounds like you you were really able to kind of listen to what was going on or like how your work was being received and you recognize that like, okay, I've got something here and this is a good thing. Yeah, and I, I think I think like there's a little bit of, this is that balance between like art and, and, and the science of data, right? The, the data would be try to engineer something that can go viral. Yeah. And I don't, I don't see it so much like, black and white as that, I think that the more that you absorb from the place that you're, you know, creating for mm -hmm. through osmosis or through direct, you know, observational diligence, mm -hmm. the more that you do observe, it really does inform a sense of, of activating a curiosity to create the type of thing that's missing. Okay. And I think that for me as a creator, I've only been interested in making the types of things that are missing from, <laughs> from this massive landscape. Yeah. So that, that's kind of how I've created things that stand out, but it's from a pure place of curiosity. I think that's what matters. If anyone on this podcast is a creator making things. Yeah. And the goal is to get attention in as many eyeballs as possible. I think very, very intelligently about what there's too much of out there mm. what feels unique and interesting and make sure it comes from an authentically curious place mm. and how do you know sometimes like sometimes if you want to create do you, i mean maybe you don't ever get into a place like this but if you're ever in a space where you maybe have finished with a project and you want to create something and you're not feeling inspired is there anything that you do to try and like access that feeling of curiosity or interest, or maybe it's just existing, but do you have anything specific that you're like, yeah, I, I try and do X? I think a lot of this is tied down to a question of what really lights up a fire inside here. Mm -hmm. what, what obsesses you, mm -hmm. what fixates you because that is the stuff from which beautiful things can happen if you just put in some effort, some time, some hours, some finessing of the technical craft mm. that allows it to come out. And for me, obsessiveness, fixation has been around um, ideas. I just, I love concepts that feel unique. Mm -hmm. feel different mm -hmm. and if it necessitates spending 200 hours with barely eating or drinking anything locked in a basement wasting away like I'm in some sort of 
gulag, <laughs> then that only makes it more exciting and worth it. Mm -hmm. And this is just such a lesson in what, what, what is anyone willing to kind of kill themselves for? Yeah. Just because it makes them feel like they're living. Yeah. It sounds like super dramatic. No, it's, yeah, I understand what you, what you mean, because even I was talking to my friend about this the other day, we were talking about exams, and I know it sounds it's totally different, but when you can find something that that kind of puts you on a different plane of function as a human being, like when you can find something that you're not really listening, this isn't maybe that healthy to promote, but whatever, when you're not really listening to like your hunger or like you're, you're holding off from going to the toilet because whatever you're focusing on is like way more important. And the reason I mentioned exams is because when you have pressure of exams, like I remember doing GCSEs and A-levels in the UK, and it's, you know, an insanely intense timeline, but you apply yourself. For that reason, it's different because you've got pressure. And for it's different when you have a project that you just love, but when you're just operating at this level that like your brain is so focused, and I think they, they have a word for it, like when you get into flow or whatever, when something like ignites your soul, like that fire that you're talking about, it's, um, it's an, probably one of the best feelings as a human that you can experience. Absolutely. You're so right. And I think that a lot of people get tripped up because they put the cart in front of the horse. They say, I need to figure out how this can be a career for me or that I can get paid to do this so that I don't have to do anything else and I can spend all my time doing it. But I think the, the odds of that happening are more likely if you are authentically about this as just a hobby for no money. Mm. So if you get in that rhythm and you're doing it authentically for the fun of it, for the thrill of it, for trying to attain that goal of possibly, you know, reaching an audience and getting that feedback that they enjoyed what you created, mm. it tends to go in a way where money and career end up sorting itself out after that condition. Mm -hmm. And those who think about it too much end up getting tripped up and it, it just becomes a point of frustration that they're not making a career out of it. You know? Yes. If you didn't have an audience, do you think you would still create what you do? Well, I don't, like I've never, I've never thought about having an audience like the audience you have where there is a familiarity of the same individuals who follow your trajectory. They stay with you. They watch you grow and they feel a part of a community. I, I don't, I don't really, I don't really have that type of audience. Yeah. My, my type of audience may be if in, since 2006, if I've made something that goes quote unquote viral, there's massive amounts of audience that flock to that thing and then dissipate. It's not like they're finding a community with each other. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like the audience, you know, audience that, that you've built is a much more intimate connection um, with, with the people who, who are watching or listening to what you're creating. Mm -hmm. But your videos are, you know, massively successful. Like, do you think that if you posted a video and it got maybe, and maybe it's, it is different and the same question can't really be applied, but, and if you got like 10 views, do you think that that would change how you feel about the thing that you made? I mean, <laughs> it's like if, if a scientist in a laboratory makes something that ends up being a failed experiment, it's not like the scientist like throws off his lab coat and says, I've had enough of this. Like, <laughs> no, you, you just, you know, you, you, I think it, I think it would be a loss if you don't dissect the experience. You don't debrief the experience to say, okay, look, you know, my goal was to get more than 10 views. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Th that, that I think is an example of a creator who wants to better him or herself when those types of questions are being asked, mm -hmm. you know, cause it's, you, you have to be in that mindset to be curious about that, to be in yeah. this space because, you know, people create art because they want art to be seen. Yeah. Like I, I've never met an artist who's like, no, I intentionally don't want anyone to walk around. Yeah. <laughs> I think like one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen is what's happened to 73 questions once a community got its hands on it and did their own versions of it. If you search 73 questions at any given time, you will see 
you know, hundreds of different people on any given month from all around the world in their own languages, taking that format and expressing it for themselves. Wow. And that, that, that I think is like another huge, powerful component of, of this equation and in yeah. this beautiful ecosystem of creating right now is that you know, TikTok is taking it to another level. But this idea that someone could be so inspired by something that they see that they take action and make something themselves. Mm -hmm their identity, their perspective, and their view. Mm -hmm. There's probably nothing more inspiring than that. And, mm -hmm. and it's a privilege to be a part of creating something that inspires people to take that and use it as their own expression of themselves. Mm -hmm. And how, how did 73 Questions come about? Well, I'm tinkering on the internet. I'm making things. Yeah. I'm being a strange digital creator who has nothing to do with films and TV or fashion or fashion photography. And... <clears throat> I was asked as kind of representation of a digital community, if you had the chance to um, pitch Sarah Jessica Parker a video, what would you do? And I said, I would, I would just ask a bunch of questions, rapid fire to her. And she ended up saying yes to that. Like, this is a very strange thing to be asked for celebrities at that time. This is early days of Jimmy Fallon where Traditionally, celebrities were seen as boring questions on a red carpet interview, boring questions on late night TV, or boring questions in front of the movie posters, mm. you know, like the, the junkets. Mm. So for Sarah Jessica Parker to say yes to an idea like that, straight, and for her to invite us into her home for the first time ever. So that's kind of how it happened. And um, it, yeah, it's, it's wild. That is wild. So, so you have, you're like, I want to ask a bunch of questions. They, you know, go to her, ask her. She's like, yeah, cool. Is she the one who suggested come to my home? Or were you guys like, we think we should do it in your house? She, she suggested it. Okay. Yeah. It was really cool. So we're there, we're in her home and we're just doing it all, you know, in one take. And it's like, oh my God, this is like really cool how she's taking this and making it her own. And, and since then, You'll know, I mean, like, this is one thing for all the people listening to this uh, who watch 73 Questions is every time you see an episode, just remember that this concept of asking tons of questions really rapidly was for Sarah Jessica Parker. Right. And what's cool about I've never imagined it like evolving into having athletes and then musicians and, and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But just know that the spirit of it is for someone like SJP. Right. And that's when it gets really cool to see all the people who are not like SGP yes. taking this format and being able to like crush it. So the evolution of it has just been like really wild. Do you think if your subject, your first subject wasn't Sarah Jessica Parker and it was, I don't know, Michael Jordan, you would have, if someone said, how would you wanted to do it? You wouldn't have said like short fight. Do you think it would have been different, the format? Oh, really? The idea wouldn't have been pitched. Yeah. It, it just wouldn't have, yeah. you know, like there's something kind of absurd and, 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 and crazy about just knocking on the door and just asking a bunch of questions without breathing all in one go. Yeah. And when you look at SJP, she's very much kind of like a, oh, oh, uh, uh, oh, this, oh, oh, sorry. And then she's like charming and then she's subtle and then she's, you know, expressive. There's, there's all these different dynamics that are happening. But it's so cool to see how something that started like that wasn't just pigeonholed like that for everyone. Mm -hmm. That it turned into this thing that has become much more natural. Mm -hmm. if you look at episodes now, they're pushing like 16 minutes. It's more of a conversation. Yeah. You know, there's less like stunty stuff. There's less cheesy, hokey things like my buddy Weston appearing and, and asking a question by appearing in someone's window, you know, like <laughs> more realistic and more conversation. Yeah. And so, did you write the questions for 73 questions? So it's gone to a point where it's, it's kind of a well-oiled machine where there's like a, you know, a small team yeah. of individuals. And right now it's led by producer Jenna Alchin and she takes the lead in every opportunity that comes through. She researches, she digs up things that are perfect for questions, mm -hmm. try to infuse a lot of, you know, uh, Vogue sensibility into yeah. a lot of questions and yeah we come up with a ton and from there it's just the process of let's match what's good for 
the celebrity. Yeah. Try to get it down to 73 questions. And what's the thing, because if you, you know, you start off, you're a kid, you love the camera, you're making your own series, you get into making a really interesting different kind of format for The Sopranos and uh, in a way for it to be digestible through digital media. But then you've got 73 questions, you're the guy asking these questions. What's the thing, and maybe there's not one thing, but what's the thing that you love that gets you like the most excited about doing 73 questions? Well, I mean, to see what it's grown into has been pretty wild. I think, I, like I said, like the, the community aspect, I think is my favorite part. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it honestly, like almost like brought me to tears one time, just like watching just how inspired this kid in a high school was just doing this as a way to, you know, reveal themselves. Like yeah. to see that at scale around the world is one of the most like moving things I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I think what, what makes it, I guess, different than a lot of the other projects is it's one thing to create something that's successful once, but when you do it over and over and over and over and over again, it mm-hmm. becomes a format, it becomes you know, an iconic thing that makes it harder for people to ignore, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I think that you know, I'm really proud of what we've done at Condé Nast because 70 questions is just one thing, but there's all of these different celebrity formats and formats with world-class experts in any field. There's all this stuff that's there that are so iconic because we've been dedicated to make hundreds of each of them. Mm. Now format culture, the idea that like come up with one thing, double down and make a bunch. Mm -hmm. I know we're like the earliest people to do that. I think like complex in that time as a publisher. Also was very, very early in it, but I think that's what makes it different now. Mm. I think what makes it different now is the opportunity for people to build audience by having um, single serving Instagram accounts, or TikTok TikTok accounts, Mm -hmm. YouTube channels, where they kind of just do the same thing over and over again. And that's how you build a a big audience. Yeah. It wasn't so much like that a long time ago. Right. Yeah, it does make sense because, you know, there's that phrase that's like, um, oh God, now I've said that, I'm going to absolutely butcher the phrase, but it's like when someone's already built something that works you don't need to make it again <laughs> that's so not it but basically that that concept and if you oh it's not broken don't fix it maybe i'm not even yeah but like if if you build a a format or a style of something that really engages people and that works and you feel like really connects with the person you're interviewing if that's the objective then i think there's something really to say for like well you, you don't need to re- reinvent the wheel that's it yeah. They reinvent the wheel. Yeah. If you're happy with the wheel. Yeah. I think, I think certain people, I think, you know, I think like a lot of influencers and creators get trapped in this a little bit is that when you do the same thing over and over again, it's really good at building an audience. Could be small, could be massive. Mm. But doing the same thing over and over again doesn't necessarily help in reaching out of that community and grabbing a bunch of people elsewhere and throwing them into your community. So mm. I think it gets interesting when creators or influencers are proving time and time again that they're pushing those edges Mm. and that they're still able to make a format or content that truly feels like it's reaching out of its own backyard Mm -hmm. and that's when in my opinion those are my favorite creators Mm. they're not satisfied with just the same thing over and over again yeah well it sounds like that you know if you are really doing what you love and you're constantly kind of questioning how can I make it better or how can I improve then your again like your soul is probably uh really wrapped in that and it's probably a good sign yeah you know absolutely I always say uh that low expectations is your best friend never go in and it's I guess this is tied to the thing that I said about hobby hobby and career Mm -hmm. never go in assuming anything owes you anything you know never go in assuming that just say to yourself, look, if I get 500 views on this, I'm going to celebrate. Mm-hmm. And oh my God, like imagine the celebration if it gets to 1000 views. And oh my God, imagine if I got 10,000 followers, like that's more within reach yeah. than I need to be famous yeah. or I need to have brands starting to pay me for what I'm doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Except- 
more realistic and you celebrate a lot more often if you have those expectations for yourself. Yes, yes. And hopefully you keep going. Um, can, so, I, can I ask really quickly? Sorry, I, I don't yeah. want to do the entire time. Mm -hmm. What were your expectations as a creator going in? Like where, where did you, what, what would you have celebrated before you started doing this? So initially, initially when I started kind of creating content and initially it was like fitness content, the only reason why I started doing it is because I, originally I didn't believe that people enjoyed going to the gym. And then from being on Instagram, I saw that people seem to enjoy it and post about it. So then I started creating content of me going to the gym just purposefully to post about it with the aim of hopefully enjoying it in real life. So that was initially what it was. And then I did start enjoying it in real life and that was really fulfilling because I was like, well, I've reached that goal and that was like something to celebrate. In terms of now creating and, and um, and what do I kind of like celebrate with that? I mean, for me, when I, whenever I make like podcast episodes or I talk to people, I have to, I have to make sure that my objective when I do it is to, is to fulfill some kind of need that I'm trying to fulfill, whether that's like to learn more, whether to under, understand someone better, whether to open my mind about a controversial opinion. And if I notice that I'm not doing any of those things, then I, uh, then I have to like kind of come back to myself and be like, why am I doing this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Learn, l go ahead. Learning through experience. And also I think, I think when you're younger, it's harder to listen to your gut or to know what you think is the right path for you because you don't really know fully who you are I mean you don't really know fully who you are at any point but I think that if you are creating it's so important to strengthen that sound of this is right this is wrong do I enjoy this do I not and so as I create that's the number one like navigator that I'm trying to use right and making sure you're still in love with it I think every every day like you know am I loving what I'm doing you're, you're feeling that and exactly and having the the freedom to be like, if I'm not loving what I'm doing, I'll give myself the time to tre try and realign. But if it's not working, you have to be free in the sense of being like, I can drop this. And sometimes it's good to change and move on. Absolutely. To yeah. reinvent, to yeah. iterate and, uh, and discover where you can maximize the feeling that you're getting the most quality for your time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a process. It's a process for everyone. Yeah. And one thing I would love to know about 73 questions, do you, because obviously you're dealing a lot of the time with like, you know, you're dealing with the most famous celebrities in the world. One, do you feel like it's important to have a connection with those people beforehand so they feel comfortable with you, especially because you're coming into their home? Is that uh, like a priority or something that um, you try and do? I wouldn't define connection as, hey, we need to get to know each other before the shoot coming up on Thursday. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's have a bunch of conversations. Let's go out shopping together. Uh, you know, definitely not that. Not that <laughs> but I would define connection as a feeling of making them feel extremely comfortable. And that is the professionalism of the crew in their home. Mm. Make sure that they're respectful of their space to check in on them, to introduce yourself and, you know, to have some conversation that shows that um, I care about them more as just a person who's kind of, you know, doing this because they're promoting something, you know, mm -hmm. like I think on a human level, uh, trust is important. I think with a lot of celebrities, this is kind of a daunting task. I think for a lot of people who are actors, this is especially ones that are good at comedy. This is a, a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. you know, like it's something that they can, most likely do in their sleep, you know? Yeah. I think for people who are not like that, it can be a little bit nerve wracking, like trying to answer all these questions while a choreography is being done all in one take. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of, the, one of my favorite moments specifically are when some celebrities who go into this are like, oh my God, I'm nervous. Like, how am I going to pull this off? Mm -hmm. And they, we may do the take once because we do this multiple times. And they may be stumbling, <clears throat> they may be forgetting some lines, they may be forgetting where to go, I may have to instruct them. But when we do it a second time, it's like a wrinkly shirt that has less wrinkles in it. Right. 
and there's that feeling of that con of connection where a smile lights on their face and it's nothing but excitement and confidence that this is only going to get better and they're going to nail it. Yeah. And that feeling of everyone on set, which is kind of a little bit tense, like, oh God, this is like so challenging to pull this off, immediately is, com is comforting when we all know that this is going to be so much fun and we're going to nail it. Yeah. And there, there's a moment, there's an actual moment where that happens. And sometimes it happens when I meet someone. Like Roger Federer, when I met him, just runs up to me and goes, Joe, and just gives me a big hug. It's so great that you're here. That's one of those things where you know everything's gonna be okay after that happens. Yeah. But for other people, it's a little bit like we have to get into the takes to, to find it. Yeah, and I guess as well, if they, if they are nervous about it and then they have you who's there, who can make them feel better about it, direct them a bit, and then, then you have that kind of mutual trust for them, which is like, you're there and you're like, I'm gonna make this okay. Like, you know, this is gonna be okay. And I guess that helps them get through it and you can kind of bond over that. Absolutely. And once again, I cannot stress professionalism of team enough. The fact that a team of people are so respectful of someone's personal space goes such a long way. Mm. So much is riding on that. Mm -hmm. So just, it's a, it's a massive collective effort there. And do you ever get nervous beforehand or do you ever like need to kind of get in the zone of doing it? Like, how do you feel before you go in and film? I'm vomiting violently every single time, <laughs> uh, every, every, prep, every rehearsal. I'm using their bathrooms and just vomiting. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Please do not take that sound bite. Um, I, yeah, I think the thing that makes this different than like a sit down interview like an Oprah sit down interview, uh, kudos to her killing it with it with with Megan. Um, clearly, I'm, I'm not in any way comparing subject material to something like that. But the format of sitting down and really digging in deeply into the complexity of an issue to kind of have thoughtful conversation that you know is is rich in thought. That that, that this is subject questions is not the format for that. Clearly. There's so much to be mindful of beyond the questions and the answers of making sure that this is a balanced choreography that explores multiple rooms in a house yeah. while feeling like it's flowing, it's moving, and the audience doesn't have any time to get bored. Yeah. That's what's on my mind. Yeah. What's on yeah. my mind is completing the take. Right. And I, if there's any nervousness, it's an energy that's seeking the moment when I know that's all going to be solved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think like, I think it's that energy of it's nerves until you know the take is going to be locked. Yeah. And then when it's done, that's the best part because it's like, all right, we got the take. Yeah. We'll do one more for safety, but we know we have like a, a great take and that, then it's like, oh God, we don't have to like stress out anymore. Yeah. And have you ever had it where you felt like, ah, oh, I don't know if we're going to get that feeling. Like, have you ever been stressed out about that? And has that ever happened where you haven't? Well, I mean, there's definitely some times where it's like, oh my God, like, I, I don't know if we're going to get this day. Right. Because there's just so many challenges going on. But in the end, knock on wood, you know, we've, we've successfully done this like 71 times now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's always worked out. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. Um, I think like one, one question you asked was, you know, on the, on the document before yeah. I came here was, is there one celebrity who kind of just didn't want to see any of the questions? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, there is one person and that's Liam Gallagher. No way. Liam Gallagher, here we are in um, Hempstead Heath. Yeah. And he just shows up, didn't look at any of the questions. And I'm suggesting a rehearsal, just a walkthrough to say, look, we're going to go down that hill under that tree, walk around the bend and go where the dogs are. Yeah. Like a good kilometer of walking. Kilometer, see how mindful of your audience? <laughs> mindful of you. Nice. Um, I remember he's like, let, let, let's just do it. Come on, let, let's, just, let's just do it. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm fine. Let's just do it. I'm like, all right, uh, we rolling? All right, I guess we're filming this. <laughs> I can so imagine him like, yeah, fuck it, mate. It's fine. <laughs> you watch that video. It is the only time a true one take non-rehearsed experience has ever happened. Wow. Wow. And when we finished, wow, we did it. 
He answered every single question. He kept going. The number one rule of this is you have to keep going. Okay. Kept going. He, mm -hmm. Like, don't break the take is what we say. Don't break the take. Yeah. And he, he, he did it. He finished it. And at the end, um, I'm like, okay, we got it. Now, let's just do it like one more time, you know, just to make sure to be even more finessed and all that. And uh, he's like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and then he just left. <laughs> We just drove away. Yeah. Drove away. <laughs> and we we're there with the team looking at um, my producer Marina at the time. I'm like, was that reality? I'm like, did that, <laughs> did that really just happen? And I go to Jess, Jess who's on camera. He's, I'm like, Jess, like, you got all that? Like, it looked good on camera? He's like, yeah, it's fine. He, he nailed his cues and it was fine. <laughs> That's awesome. Believable. So there's tons of there's tons of stories. Yeah, and so do you feel because seventy three questions is so big and like you know fundamentally if you you left HBO and you're working as a freelance artist for a while, do you ever feel like seventy three questions is so big that you can't disassociate your name from it? No, it's 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 just the thing I'm grateful for. Yeah, it's this thing that I wouldn't trade for anything. I'm happy I have it in my life. Um, you know, it's still going, um, slower cadence than a few years ago where it was like tw like twice a month at one point. Wow. But no, it's 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 a thing that gives people joy. And you know, I'm I'm happy to be a part of that. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Simple as that. Um, I don't worry about this defining me. I don't care. Um it's just a thing in my life that I'm grateful for. Yeah. And if it can help me, you know, uh explore other projects and things out there and you know to go into go in a room and someone's heard of something that you've made. i mean like yeah that helps of course that helps but yeah. at the end of the day like continuing something for a long time doesn't mean that i need to stop the exploration of new things mm -hmm. you know just just keep going and what because obviously i read that article where you left Condé nast because you wanted to kind of go back to your roots as an artist what does that mean and, and how are you exploring that if now you are? There is a, a big identity thing with me working at a company like Condé because I came in as someone who made things with my own hands. Like right. everything I did, Soup to Nuts, was either shooting something or spending time editing it, like deeply, deeply ingrained into the thing that I'm making. And with 73, like it was very much that, you know? so. To come in a company as someone literally working out of cafes for years, you know, as a, as a freelancer, to then have a team of people that you're responsible for leading the creative development of hundreds and upon hundreds of ideas with thousands of videos. It, there's a weird duality there in the hat of creator and the hat of, you know, creative executive. Whatever. Yeah. So wearing those two hats at the same time, especially with 73, and then especially about leading one of the best teams I could possibly ask for. Um, after six years of that, you're like, all right, well, I, you know, I've done the corporate thing. I could not be prouder of what we achieved with the formats that we've made for these brands. But it's like, okay, that, that challenge feels like it's kind of done. Let's, Let's go back to the world where every day I have no idea what opportunity is going to fall in my lap yeah. as, a, as a creator. Yeah. So I've always had the creator hat on just for a period. I had a second hat, which is kind of like leader of team in corporation. So I mm. took that hat, placed it back on the rack. And now I just have kind of the creator hat. And yeah, I'm just back to that. And was that really hard going from going from freelance and doing your own thing to then if you have a team of people because you're leading a team of people is like there's a lot of skill that has to come with that like that that's really tricky was it something that you kind of uh took to and started enjoying straight away or did it take time to get into it i've only been excited about great ideas and for a company to give that much freedom for these ideas to be made was a dream okay. it was a dream come true so that freedom was just incredible Mm. and to and to not just have me be excited about ideas but have people in a company genuinely excited to make things that people watch 
was a blessing to have mm. that environment. Mm. Metaphor, I have a lot of metaphors. The metaphor I use for the idea of being a freelancer versus full time is imagine yourself as a freelancer. You're working the docks, the dockyards. You know, all these ships are coming in, you show up, and your job is to work with other people on the docks. On this ship today is a big ship. We're going to be fixing the sails, we're going to be joining their crew, fixing the sails. And then when we're done, the ship's going to sail off. You may never see this ship ever again. It may come back. You may see the same crew members on the dock sometimes. You may never see them again. And then next day, another ship comes in. Sometimes it's two ships at the same time, right? So that's the life of being on the docks. You have no idea what's going to come into harbor, yeah. to Port Harbor. When you're full time, you're in the ship. You're in the ship. Like you're the one going to different ports, maybe meet, meeting outside people, but you're with the same people in the ship. You have your hand on, on the wheel of the direction of where that ship goes. Uh, sometimes you love the crew. Sometimes the crew ends up like leaving and then gets switched with other people that join the crew. But that's, that's life as a full-timer. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think um, that's the best metaphor I can come up with. Like what, for anyone who's navigating the whole freelance versus full-time, mm -hmm. just know that it, we're so lucky to be in a media space now where you can make the choice mm -hmm. to be on the boat or be on the docks. Mm -hmm. At least the dock, dock, docks these days can provide a living for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's so interesting about now. Mm -hmm. And do you prefer being on the docks to being on the ship? I think at, at this stage in my life, yeah, like sign me up for the docks. Like yeah. I'm meeting so many different people, more people than what I would meet in the capacity of being kind of in, in the ship, right? And it just it just feels like, yeah, it just feels like every every day, every week, every month is an unanticipated serendipitous, you know, encounter with some other people who I, who I get the pleasure of working with, who may want to collaborate on something and looking at the docket, a lot of docs, but this docket <laughs> of just multiple things happening at the same time. Yeah. All so diverse, so different from each other is currently the mode that I'm uh, really enjoying. I'm really. Yeah. Enjoying. It's really lovely to talk to you because you seem extremely positive and um willing to just kind of like take life as it comes and live in the moment and see the joy in um different things that kind of come to you which is um which is lovely do you think that you are overall like a happy person i i do yeah i do i i i'm generally like this a lot but at the same time i'm someone who's self-aware enough to realize that that improvement, you know, issues like improvement, which is what you talk about constantly, you know, on this podcast, mm -hmm. is that there's always room for growth. There's always room for figuring out uh, how improvement can be a part of your life and then adapting routines and lifestyles to, 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 to always seek, um, to seek that ideal mm -hmm. of always trying to be every day a little bit more improved than the day before. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's the best way I mean, I, I can't really speak for the whole of humanity, but I do feel like that is the one of the most exciting ways and also one of the best ways to to feel constantly young. Do you know what I mean? Because I feel like if we ever got to a point in, in anyone's life where they feel like, oh, okay, I've, I, I'm my full product, like I've learned enough now at this point, like you would just feel so, um, I guess, like uncurious about trying to get better or improve and would sort of feel like you reach the end of your life as I feel like life should on a day-to-day -day basis if you're trying to learn something new and um, get better in some way then it's a good way to always feel kind of like oh I didn't know that I still feel like I'm eight and figuring stuff out which is cool you're so right about that you're so right about that and I think as as you get older at least I'm feeling this way that wow time's flying like it's really coming at me faster there's a saying that now I'm really thinking about you know where days are long and years are short and one thing that you said there, which I think I just want to emphasize that you're spot on about is, is learning, seeking knowledge, creating things that are different from each other, will end up creating this dilation of time that maybe feels like you're, you're existing in, in like a, a longer period. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, the great, a great thing to maybe reference here is my buddy, 
you know, my, my best friend, Aaron Rasmussen, he's the co-founder of Masterclass and he's doing this amazing thing in the higher ed right now. He, for, I think like for a full year, decided to learn something new every single day. Wow. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, Joe, it felt like the longest time of my life. No way. Yeah. Like whether it's like a little craft work or, you know, uh, you know trying some, some challenge that he sees. Uh, yeah, it has an effect. So I've never, <laughs> never had the ability to do something that requires so much discipline as that. But it's worth emphasizing that maybe for your audience here, like maybe maybe that's a new challenge you could do. You yeah. talk about going to the gym and falling in love with it. Yeah. What if you challenge yourself to do something like that where you're going to learn something new every day? Yeah, that's awesome. I would love to try and do that. That's a really, um, that's a cool thing to try and think about. With your looking back on, well, not looking back, I guess. Yeah, I guess kind of in a way looking back. If you were to chat to yourself on October 13th, all those years ago, or that kid at that time, or, you know, where you were in your life at that time, could see where you're at today. What do you think, how do you think they would feel about not just the art you've created, but, you know, the person that you've become or like where you are in your life right now? I think they'd be confused at the idea of me spending 365 days in this room on Zoom. <laughs> I think Joe would, Joe would be scratching his head in that regard. Um, I don't know. I think... I think there's just this ser mystical serendipity about it all, which is kind of like in line with what I've embraced and I've never resisted, is just to never have a real plan any one year in advance, to not care about that, mm -hmm. to just stay focused on what excites you. Mm. And get good at it. I, I don't want to diminish you know, the technical aspect of this. Like I, I tell every single college kid, for advice it's not so much as abstract as you know make sure you develop uh, a good rapport or make sure that you take a job you know for the boss and not for the job which by the way is advice i still give i i like to give advice more about spend thousands of hours editing video and, and become an expert at it yeah because that gives you freedom to express your ideas more freely not depending on anyone else to do it for you now that's just an example of what i say but but there's a lot of, there's something like sneaky about that advice because what I'm telling people is to get good at editing. But what they don't realize I'm telling them to do is just spend your time focused on one thing and find how ideas can bubble up, how, where you can find obsessions and things. Mm. And I think that repeated methodology of, of getting really good technically at something is just an incredible radar detection for finding out what the hell you love. Mm. That's what I love about video editing. That's just mm -hmm. one way to do that. So I challenge all the listeners here to find maybe a technical thing that you would have to do for hundreds of hours and then see what percolates to the surface from it. I guess as well, it reminds me of what you're saying of like becoming extremely good at one specific thing if you want to then learn how to express yourself or try and express yourself better at some point. It reminds me of just like communication. like. If you, or, or any kind of, you know, if you're trying to, you know, understand a certain group of people better, whether that's through like learning a language or like honing in on your skills of whatever it might be in order to um, connect, I guess what we were talking about community a lot, connect with that community that you're drawn to more. Like if you can get involved in it by finessing a specific skill, that sounds like a great way to access it or just increase your chances of accessing it and also meeting like-minded people and finding what you love. And that is exactly what you're doing with it, with with something like a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Repeatedly, over and over again, having the same methodology of an interview to extract learning, mm -hmm. to realize what you're good at, to realize what you should double down on, right? Mm -hmm. Repeated behavior of things. Here we are saying that you should learn something new every day, but mm -hmm. at the same time, repetitive action over something you love is going to have very surprising effects mm -hmm. and, and what you gain that you can never anticipate. So that's what I would say to someone, you know, to me as a younger version is that if you, you know, get ready, because if you keep doing this, you'll have plenty of stories to tell in your life. Mm. I watched this amazing documentary on Netflix um, about this guy, I think he was called Jiro, but I'm not 100% sure, who was like an absolute expert at making sushi. And he had just, oh, do, have you seen it? Jiro dreams of sushi. Yes. 
Great. Great. So he's like, you know, an expert doing that. And every single day, his, one of his, I think both of his sons work in um, his restaurant, but will come in and just, um, I think he has to like do something with the sushi paper. And that's all he does like every day for years until he can become an expert in that. And there's something so honorable in that level of commitment consistently. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, I think it was uh, the egg guy who also spent like 30 years making perfecting eggs wow. for Giro in that movie yeah. and it ended up opening his own like egg specialty place in Manhattan, I think. But anyway, um, I think it says a lot about presentness. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I've, I've been intrigued a lot more about, you know, present mindfulness, presentness as, as with a lot of people right now. But I think the appeal of it is that when you're pulled in so many different directions and everything is biting at your attention and and it requires like an industry like this requires, you know, miniaturization of, of so many different niche skills to have a full package of something that's marketable. At the same time though, getting really, really good at one thing and only doing one thing is an incredibly healthy, healthy thing for the mind, mm. you know, to just focus center, be present in the act and not to think of anything else. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure research right now, but in the future will prove that people who are skilled and able to do that more often, it's going to be correlated with happier and healthier lives. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, a lot to say for that. Cause even with like multitasking, I think stuff has come out to say multitasking isn't actually a thing. It's just, you're spending less time doing two things at once. Like, it's not like, Oh, I'm so good at spending the exact same amount of attention on two things. It's like, no, no, you are less good at doing those two things and not focusing on the task in front of you is, uh, can I think in a way I know it's like a, an added amount of time but like can make your life just go so much faster especially when you're like juggling several things on at the moment and just make you more stressed and do things less well and yeah that's right yeah you're just chasing uh check uh you know check marks on the to-do list yeah now that feeling like that feeling of checklists like I don't, I don't know if you're the same way but it feels satisfying when you just like crossing things off right yeah a hundred percent that's a dangerous game though when you think about it <laughs> As we wrap this up, I know we've gone past the time, we're wrapping up now. I just wanted to ask, lastly, if you have any advice for anyone listening in any part of the world or whoever age they are, um, what would that advice be? I think it's just kind of a recap of the things I've, I've already said. Um, number one, learn how to edit video. <laughs> Everyone should just get really, really good at that. Um, be kind. I think that's the best advice I've ever received from my mentor, uh, Fran. <clears throat> Just be kind. No one is going to get ahead by being an awful human being. Mm -hmm. And another one is get excited. Just get excited. Get excited about anything. Like this <clears throat> world is full of so many reasons uh, that you should be excited about something. And it's just a shame. It's a shame if, um, if you're not getting excited about something. Mm -hmm. And then from there, curiosity about what you're excited about can grow into beautifully serendipitous and mystical things. So awesome. that's what I would encourage. I really encourage that for, for everyone listening. Perfect, perfect. That was um, that was awesome. I'm going to end this recording here.